Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of the Jolly Heretic. Now, the Victorian traveller and adventurer was something of an archetype uh, in, uh, in 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 the UK, and we don't get you know, Scott of the Antarctic, whatever, and we don't get that many of them anymore. But it seems that uh, it's it's a new and rising thing, danger tourism, should we call it? I don't, I don't, I don't know. And we have uh, one such chap here today who I wanted to talk to. Uh, he goes by the name of Lord Miles, and he has spent a great deal of time in Taliban-run Afghanistan, uh, not least uh, uh, at their pleasure in prison. And um, and I would like to um, I would like to discuss with him his adventures and uh, and what he got up to and whether uh, uh, Afghanistan is a salubrious uh, tourist destination. So, uh, Ma uh, Lord Miles, hello. Yes, hello. How do you do, everyone? Lovely. Are you actually a peer of the realm, or is it like like Lord David such? No, no. I uh, I did commit identity fraud, and it seems like it's stuck in my credit file. So, the Lord, I'm working up to it. Did you did you buy a lord? Did you buy a Scottish lairdship? No, no. So there's a form you submit when you're considered a lord or want to actually be registered as a lord in the UK. And I may have done that in 2019. I put on my best suit whilst at university, and I walked into I walked into the bank at the busiest time, so the tellers wouldn't look too much at it. And I just put on my uh, posh's voice. Said, oh yes, my father bought some uh, lands, and uh, he's been he's been knighted, and now he's a lord. And just presented it, and they said, "Oh well, we won't question it." Scanned it in, it went on my credit file, and it's never been questioned since. Somehow, I'm sorry. What? No, I'm I'm recording a video now. I'm recording a video now. No, I haven't, and I'm recording a video now. Okay, yes, I have taken a slice of your cake. It didn't look nice. So, no, I took one that would have been cut. Teenage daughters. Um, she, she, um, she made a uh, made a, a blueberry cake last night. Yes, you need to take another slice, teacher. I, I think I will. I will take a very big slice just to just to annoy. Good man. I'm going to absolutely use it. So, anyway, where were we? Yes. So, um, where did you, where did you go to? Uh, so, how did you? You're quite young, as I get the impression, both from looking at you and your face. So, um, where, where did you go to university? Loughborough University to study. You studied something useful like Arabic or Hashish no, no, or just physics. Um, but then I changed my subjects after two years. Uh, I went to a different university. Um, I went to London Business School and did banking and finance online. Okay, okay, banking and finance. And so then, how how on earth from there did you did you get into making your way to Afghanistan? Well, I was going to work for an investment bank, and they had a program where they would pay for your holiday before you start your grueling one hundred twenty hours a week or something. So it was a peak of COVID, and my only country that was open to British uh, citizens without the vaccine was Afghanistan. So I thought that'd be a brilliant idea. Nothing could go wrong. So I turned up, and of course, everything went wrong. Um, and the fall of Kabul just happened around me, as it casually does to all of us from time to time. Okay, so you, you you turned up just as Kabul was falling, just as the country was changing regime back to the Taliban after twenty years of of um, the American propped up. North oh yes, yeah. oh yes, three days beforehand. So I turned up. I was doing some sightseeing. I started posting online, um, specifically for Chan, just saying, "Hey, look, I'm in Afghanistan. It's a lovely holiday. Everything's really cheap at the moment. I can't imagine why." Um, and then everyone was saying, Miles, the Taliban are rolling over mountains right now into Kabul. I said, OK, I've got half a day still. I can go, still go sightseeing on the other half of the mountain they haven't rolled down um, <laughs> from. So <laughs> that was lovely. And then as things collapsed, I started driving frantically towards the airport, trying to buy a ticket online. My card gets declined because it looks like there's a purchase in Afghanistan. So I have to call up my bank. And of course, it's an Indian man. And he's saying... Oh, sir, you know, you, you need to do authentication. I go, bloody hell, the Taliban are about to kill me. Uh, get my get my transactions through immediately. And he's like, oh, okay, sorry to hear that, sir. I guess we'll put it through right now. Um, and then the, all the flights were closed. And from that point, I was on my own. Bugger. So, before, so this, in the nice few days you had in Afghanistan, for those yeah. of us, like most of us that haven't been there and probably never will, uh, what, what were the things that really stuck out about the nature of Afghanistan, if you compare it to any other country you'd, uh, you've been to or even any third world country? What were the things that were different? 
Well, the good thing is you don't have to interact with many naggy women, so it's uh, quite a peaceful place in some areas. Can't imagine why. Um, mm -hmm. it must, they must be so happy, they have no complaints. Um, the, other, the other reason, I just say it's a very beautiful country. It's very mountainous, so you have these incredible views, snow-topped mountains, but at the same time, it's sandy at the bottom. It looks something uh, out of a fancy land almost. The waters in the summer can be uh, pearly, uh, baby blue, and... At the same time, the food is incredibly cheap and it's it's very good. They have the best kebabs out of out there. Um, but I wouldn't invite them to England for mass immigration just because of that. And um, what else? I don't know. The people are just friendly. Safe. safe. Like, sorry. Is it safe? Like safe streets? Safe? Well, I guess now it is. Um, although at time to time it has its incident. You know, I would go as far to say it's safer than London because the stabbing rate in Afghanistan is near zero. But um, with London, it's incredibly dangerous nowadays. I would never go to London. But um, in contrast, it's safer than a lot of places. Okay. Um, and, and not many women around. They're, they're all in the house. Yes, or they're just keeping themselves in the street. And they, and they were they still wearing these complete face-covering burqas or when you were there? Or would they stop wearing those because of the new regime? A few of them. Um, a few of them were. It's, it's a weird ratio. So I would say 30 to 40% just have a headscarf on, it shows the whole face, and no one has a problem with it. About 20 to 30 percent have that full head covering look, and about uh, a small percentage have the the letterbox uh, type look. Um, but no one really shows all their hair apart from kids up to about 10 years old, 11 years old. That's the general. Okay. okay, all right. So then, so, so then it starts to get. So, right, so you're enjoying yourself in Afghanistan. Uh, and then the Taliban are rolling in from the, uh, is it the south they control? I can't remember. Um, huh? e everywhere surrounding Kabul at this point. Okay, everywhere everywhere surrounding Kabul, and uh, in they come. And so what happens, it's uh, slightly worrying, uh, and you can't get a ticket to get out of the country. And what happens now? Yes, yeah, so I'm walking away from the airport, and they're rolling in with their trucks and their machine guns. The last area of what to be conquered was the airport. And they saw me and I thought, oh, bugger, I'm dressed like a Westerner. I have a cross around my neck. Um, they've definitely seen it and they give me a dirty look. What I should do is I should just cross the road. And it'll be funny because if they let me cross the road, I should be fine. I can quickly escape into a busy market. But if I cross the road, I'll be delaying the fall of Kabul by about three seconds by blocking traffic of the military trucks coming in. So I just quickly crossed the road, had no problems. Um, it was kind of a funny interaction. They started giving me a thumbs up and waving at me. I say waving back and said, lovely holiday, and carried on walking. Then out of nowhere in the market, two armed Taliban came up to me and they cornered me and said, what are you doing here? What's your purpose? And I go, oh, a tourist. And I say, tourist, in this time? I'm like, yeah, you know. And they go, okay, well, where are you from? And they say, where's, where's your passport? I, I hand it to them. I said, I'm from uh, Wales. And they go, Wales? Where is Wales? I say, well, you know, Wales is a, an occupied land by the English. You know, one struggle. We're just like you. We're, we're going for our own uh, occupation right now. And they're like, whoa, so true. Honestly, enjoy your holiday, man. And then they change their demeanor completely and let me go. Right. From but then when, when did it start to get difficult? Oh, yeah. So I turned up at this, this compound that apparently had um, Western fighters in. Uh, it was a whole UN compound. And as we turned up, there was a huge crowd of people. But of course, I'm British. I pushed my way through um, because no one was queuing. So they don't respect the queue. I don't respect them. When we get to the front, uh, there's a there's a Turkish uh, military official there. And he goes, oh, only only Turkish citizens in. I say, don't worry, man. I'm not Greek. And he laughs a little bit and goes, actually, come on in. Uh, so <laughs> I, get on in, I get on in and then I'm greeted by British military. And they realize who I am and they start shaking my hand and go, we've seen your tweets, you're hilarious, lovely. Here's the Wi-Fi. Now that was a terrible thing. So I started um, live streaming my entire uh, ordeal at that point. And then I had the British SAS uh, commander come in. He's a spe uh, special forces. And he starts giving me a hard time for recording and live streaming the entire fall of Kabul from the compound. Um, but it's quite all right. 
And then they all invite me to go drinking afterwards with them. So this is the first time I've tried a drop of alcohol. So I'm having shots with a British SAS. They're giving me um, a loaded M16 body armor saying, hey, Miles, if you have to defend yourself, that'll be more than fine. We hear gunshots in the background. It's, it's nighttime at the moment. And there's bullets ricocheting off our building and off our bulletproof windows. So we start, uh, we start getting a tad nervous. Mm -hmm. And at one point, the C-17 uh, is ready for evacuation. So we're led out and we see a bunch of Taliban rip, uh, whipping uh, a group of people who have tried to escape uh, into the western side of the airport. And we kind of walk through no man's land where there's Taliban um, for Western compound and just us. So as walking by, it's incredibly tense. Some people are shooting guns into the air. It gets um, a bit close to our ears, but it's more than fine. And eventually we get over to the Western side. And from there, it's uh, incredibly- you're with, British, you're with British military? Yes, yes. I'm so surprised big... this isn't completely safe, but okay. Yes, so there's a big group of us actually. There's about 200 or so Indonesian uh, workers, all males. So they've been working in telecommunications and infrastructure and have sadly been uh, left there. But the British military uh, gets us to the C-17 and after a few nights of waiting around in the airport, waiting for clearance to fly out, I fly out back to Dubai. But the thing is, when I fly out, I still have my, uh, I still have my body armor with me that's been gifted to me by the, uh, by the British. And because of this, everyone assumes I'm a soldier. So when I arrive in Dubai, I just act natural and I'm able to keep this body armor, even a few magazines of, um, of bullets. And again, I fly out and when I get to England, I, I get to keep the body armor, which I shouldn't legally have. And it's still in my house to this day. It's a lovely, lovely souvenir. I'm sorry, so how, how did things become difficult with the Taliban then? I don't understand. You've got back to oh, England. You mean the uh, arrest? Yes. Oh, no, that was on my eighth trip to Afghanistan. Oh, so this is your... Ah, oh, so, oh, oh, well, that, that's slightly suspicious if you're going to continuously go to Afghanistan. Oh, yes, yes. I started, um, I started doing some business there. So I started selling uh, military surplus. I started selling military patches, uh, Taliban headbands, Taliban flags. And I do make a good chunk of change off it. Because some items would cost $1, I can sell them at $40. And in, in the volume of tens of thousands of orders, I'm making a pretty penny. So... From there, I go back, and I believe on my sixth or eighth time to Afghanistan, um, they corner me in a Western Union when I draw some money, and they point guns at me. And I turned to my friends at the time and said, oh, I'm sure it's a, a five-minute ordeal. Turns out it is, sadly wouldn't be. And then from there, they formally arrest me, they put bags over our heads, and they drive us to the ball and stuck, stick us in an interrogation room. And then from there, I find out they suspect I'm a spy. Expect a jolly old me is uh, MI6. And I bloody wish I was because I'll be paid for those eight months in custody. But uh, alas, I wasn't. But um, what happened was, first day, I was brought into an interrogation room. And there's about eight or so Taliban in this room, all surrounding me in this very small room. So when is, when is, when is, when is this? When? This is roughly March of 2023. No, and, March. I, and I understand that your friends broke and just dropped you in it. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So one of my friends, um, there were two friends with me, both their first time, rather unfortunate. And one of them sold me out by telling them I was a spy during the interrogations, which made it infinitely harder than me. I feel like I would have been out in about three weeks if he didn't lie to them, because they were incredibly suspicious. And of course, they were a tad paranoid because they don't know their understanding of global politics or actually what a spy is. So when my friend... Uh, just said, oh yeah, Moses is a spy, let me go, and sold me out. Um, I I was suddenly um, subject to eight months of, you know, hardship, even though it was a lovely stay uh, compared to others. But when I was in the interrogation room, the first time, surrounded by eight or ten members of the Taliban, all giving me death stares, and the, the senior of them, I, liked, uh, I later find out the head of foreign intelligence, so the head of the CIA or MI6 equivalent of the Taliban, they hand me a loaded, loaded M16. And they say, Miles, we want you to uh, check if it's loaded or not. How would you do this? Now, of course, this is a test. They want to see if I know how to handle a rifle and if I'm a soldier or not, right? So 
I pick up a rifle and they expect me to check for magazine, check for barrel, three point turn, whatever. Now, of course, I turned the safety off and I pointed for the roof of my head and click. It doesn't go off. There's no bullet in the chamber. It's unloaded. They wouldn't hand a loaded uh, weapon to a, uh, a prisoner. So I just almost suicided myself, point the rifle at the back of my neck, click, doesn't go off. Then I point it at the head of foreign intelligence, click, it doesn't go off. They're completely stunned in a state of total stupefaction. So I hand the M16 back to them begrudgingly, and I go, ah, oh, you know, it wasn't loaded. Why can't you load it next time? Again, dead silence until the head of foreign intelligence starts cracking up laughing. He goes, oh, this man is funny. I like this funny man. They all burst out laughing. From that point, the head of foreign intelligence calls for there to be a tea and cakes and ice cream to be brought in. And then from there, the, the ice is broken. It was the best networking event of my life up to that point. But they've been quite unpleasant to you prior to that. Yes, prior to that, uh, some intense interrogations. Uh, the waiting room, or at least the holding cell, wasn't too nice. It was my first uh, forced introduction to a squat toilet without toilet paper. So you can imagine how that was. Um, there were some crazy people in there too. I came across schizophrenics who, uh, who threatened our lives. I came across... Uh, Afghans who have been there for two or three months at a time. Um, and it was a very small space and the food was just very carb heavy. So it, and of course there was no sunlight. There was no, no windows, no mattresses. We slept on the floor for a first few days. So for me, it was rather uncomfortable. And of course the uncertainty of it, um, the sheer idea of, we had, no one knew who, where we were. We had no idea what was happening and how long we could be here. Right, and you couldn't, I mean, your parents or whatever had absolutely no idea what was going on. No, no, no one had any idea up to this point. Uh, so they must have been panicking like anything. You were in, mm -hmm. in Afghanistan and suddenly you're, you're in Kamiakali. Oh, no, no, I've, um, I've got no contact with my parents. Um, I don't know my father uh, when it comes, I'm an IVF child, and of course, uh, at 18, I've estranged myself from my mother. Why? Oh, she's a terrible alcoholic and she's got huge mental health problems, that's unmanageable um, to a normal person to a point where the police had to be called over 10 times uh, she has a massive record and uh, god help her but certainly i can't so it's so she couldn't get pregnant she couldn't get it, it, was it that you had a father that was not really your father or was she just a single mother that got 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 a no, no she was a father that's not really my father so uh, ivf so she couldn't get pregnant and i believe she had um, some sort of medical procedure all right, and your 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 father, you're not in touch with him. He's not. No, legally, I can't even find out his identity. No, uh, I mean your your father that brought you up. No, there was no father that brought me up. So he walked out. He left. No, it was all IVF, so it was uh, unknown, basically. So, so she was a, she was a single mother, but got it was IVF. anonymous. Yes, so it was a single mother, but she couldn't get pregnant, so she got an anonymous donor through IVF. I see. I see. God. Yes. Uh, is, is, so the fact that you were in, in no contact with your mother, because by, by, by this time you were, what, 22 and you were 18 when you stopped mm. being in contact with her? Yes, 22, maybe 23. Yes. So did this in some way motivate the fact did, did the fact that, well, did you have, basically have no family? Oh, yes. It was a great motivator at the same time. Um, it doesn't really tie me down when it comes to the travel, because if I had, uh, if I had a I would say a loving family. I think I'd be a bit more cautious because I would have uh, people to answer to and also people that care about me. Um, I would obviously respect them because I wouldn't, if I, let's say I had a girlfriend that was very loving or something, I wouldn't, uh, I would, I wouldn't go to some dangerous places because I know it would either concern them or if they were okay with it, I would obviously um, change my risk factor somewhat. But with myself, I could be a bit more liberal because I understand my own risks and, I'm the one that's actually going there, so I can evaluate for risks at the time. But of course, so at, what, at what age did you kind of feel that she was just useless and you were you were raising yourself? Twelve. Sorry. Twelve years old. Twelve. Yes. What... When I can't find enough base knowledge to feed the inner workings of my mind, and I go on to Audible, and all I can find is warmed-up diarrhoea by people like Adam Rutherford and Angela Saney, I sometimes don't know what to do. But that's why I use Legion.com. Legion.com gets the most 
based books summarizes them into key salient points and reads them to you in 25 enthralling minutes, whether it's my own books or whether it's Who We Are and How We Got Here by David Reich, a fascinating book which allows us to understand in much more depth the evolution of man using archaeogenetics, taking old skeletons, analysing the different alleles and telling you exactly how we evolved. Whatever based book it is, Legion.com is the one for me. What happened, if you don't mind asking at 12, that made you have this epiphany? Yes. So I remember once uh, finding her at the bottom of a staircase and landing, um, basically collapsed, uh, half naked, in a big pool of her own blood. She pushed herself down the stairs for attention. Um, and I've got a video of this, by the way, so it's, uh, it's proof. And um, she pushed herself down the stairs by placing loads of items on the stairs, as random household items, and just makes no sense, and threw herself down there so uh, she would get attention from someone or anyone. And then I called an ambulance, of course. And uh, from this point, it's become a routine, but it really clicks in my head that she's a bit crazy. And then as soon as the ambulance comes, she just gets up and goes, actually, no, I'm fine. I'm going to bed now. And I, I have no idea why she just did it. Um, at the same time, too, I remember, actually, it, it's probably earlier, I would say about 10 years old, that uh, I thought something was up. Because I remember uh, she was on benefits at the time, so she refused to work a job, and that was before. Uh, perplexed me. I don't understand people that don't work a job or can't stand at their two feet. Um, but she didn't get. A she refused to work a job, even though she got free education in um, to work in counselling, which is ironic. And her benefits, her uh, welfare, was cut to about fifteen pounds a week. It was a height of two thousand eight, roughly. And then she was. Uh, she was saying, "Okay, Miles, we need to go to these." these bins, so these uh, rubbish trash heaps behind a supermarket. We must steal the freshly thrown out, the slightly expired food, and then we can buy, we can get the food and eat the food. And so we would stake out this supermarket for four hours a night and just jump the fence and then collect this slightly rotten food and eat it. And it was perplexing to me because I thought, you, you got offers for jobs from the government for above minimum wage. And she just refuses to work. She does this very silly game. And even at that age, I thought, you know, this is, this is absurd. I have no idea why I'm dealing with this. At 14 years old, I got a job myself and I worked 16 to 50 hours a week, depending on if it was school holiday or not. And I just supported myself. And I thought, yeah, this is absurd. I, I don't want anything to be part of this. Let's just say improvements. Uh, there's no reason I should involve in my, myself in these uh, affairs of someone who's sadly a bit too far gone and beyond my expertise and help. Did she have like a stream of men over or things like that? No, no. Um, did you have friends at school that thought it was odd that you oh, went yeah. around their houses and noticed differences? Oh yes, my, my mother would never really allow friends over. She would refuse people to come in. Um, but whenever people met her, she was a very sweet lady, so she can definitely play it off. But from what I, my understanding was, she had uh, narcissistic personality disorder and uh, was also had mania, so something like that. Um, and also minor depressive disorder. But at the same time, some of those disorders are contradictory. Um, but they were also diagnosed together from the files I found when I was slightly older. So it seems like she was either misdiagnosed or for NHS were incompetent. Who would have thought? Um, yeah. Did she not have parents and things like this and sisters and brothers that you knew? Yes, she had five sisters, but all of them were alcoholics. So it was all very cookie cutter when it came for problems. My grandfather, I believe, died two years before I was born. And my grandmother died on Christmas Day one year before I was born. OK, and then she gets a, sper a sperm donor who, if you look into the, the um, data on the kind of people that donate sperm... Yes. Often they're, they're medical students and things like this. They're quite intelligent people. What I understand was back in the 1998 to 1999 period in Britain for IVF, one of the donors was actually a doctor. Um, so I do hold a belief that my, um, I guess my father was a doctor or somehow well educated because they give you a sheet of paper that is written uh, or filled out by the father. That's the only thing or piece of information I can get. 
And there was one line he could fill out, like a message to me almost. And he says, oh, I love uh, I love studying in university and, dr and going out and drinking. And I was like, oh, <laughs> fair enough, <laughs> lovely stuff. Um, but it infers he did go to higher education. So there was some hope, some hope. Um, yeah, okay. So you're in a, it must be a strange situation when you realise that uh, you're far more intelligent than your your mother and you're, and you're brought up by her. Yeah, I kind of, um, I felt like the people surrounding me were a little bit retarded, to be, to be honest. My mm -hmm. entire street was the same. So everyone on my street was, um, they were practicing crying in the mirror uh, in order to fall the welfare office, a benefit office, to get uh, extra money per week. They'll go from... 86 pounds a week to oh golly 94 pounds a week and they would uh you know they were scrounging over this a little bit of money and they were all uh they were all i don't know just silly people they were they were concerned about such small matters in the world and they had no idea about anything what? i would ask them as a kid Why you... where in the uk is this where birmingham huh? birmingham. birmingham okay carry on yeah. sorry you would ask yeah. them what like I would, I would go to some of these people as a kid and say, "Hey, why didn't you get a job?" Like I see, I saw a listing at the local supermarket, and they were like, "No, it's it's too much work. Why can't I get a job when I get free money?" And all these people are able to work, and I just felt disgusted by this this mindset of a cheating charity and actual people that pay taxes. Actually, I don't pay my taxes, but um, you know, um, I I just found it somewhat unclean almost. I found it like these people. Who, are scrounging when they don't need to. You know, they're not in need. They're not disabled uh, physically. They they are able to work. They just find it easier to sit on their Xbox all day or watch a reality TV show instead of working. And then they have one meeting with a benefit office every six months where they can just go, oh, I'm feeling sad. And my body aches and I have back pain, which you can't diagnose or tell, but I, I definitely have it. And it hurts, and I can't do this, you know. Right, and and that was what your mother was like. It was a, a, a once a week, once a month, whatever you say, meeting uh, yes. with with the with the Nash. Yes, she would. Uh, uh, I, I I saw it several times. She would practice crying or fake crying in front of a mirror, like some sort of uh, like some sort of uh, actor before her casting or before auditions, mm. just constantly practicing it. And I thought I was bewildered. But she, but she had some talent. I mean, she could have perhaps gone into acting, but that would be too much effort. Maybe it's true. I mean, she was diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. I feel like most actors are slightly narcissistic, to put it lightly, or at least some people in media uh, are quite so. Well, they are. Yeah, they she are. Could have done something. Um, apparently, she was uh, she was quite good looking back in the day. Um, she had me rather late though. But I don't know. It seems like. By the time I left, she was roughly in her mid sixties, and it it made me think, you know, sixty sixty seven years of this type of behaviour. You know, how much how much hope is there? So she was in her mid forties when you were born. Yes. Um, okay, uh, and one wonder. And presumably, she hadn't. She'd been on benefits and so forth before that. She hadn't worked. Right? Yes, exactly. Why on earth? Did, where did she get the money from to have IVF treatment? It was free. The NHS. Well, wouldn't it, isn't it rather irresponsible for them to give IVF treatment to a single mother on benefits? Oh, exactly, yes. It was just incredibly silly. But we did it anyway. Right. Um, okay, so this kind of... Because uh, it's interesting, because I was going to ask you, obviously, you know, what would motivate... Oh, we've gone on quite a journey here, but yes, awesome. what would motivate what, what, what would motivate you to, to take such fantastic risks and to do something so avant-garde? And as you, as you as as you say, I suppose if there's just there's not there's no there's no there's no uh, there's no connections in your life, there's no bonds, then um, you were, how did you did you go to university at eighteen though? Because that's interesting. So you yeah. had every possible disadvantage in life, and yet you somehow managed to go to quite a good university. Yes. So when when I was taking my exams, um, I was homeless at the time. My mother, it's hard to explain, but my mother, she kicked me out throughout when I turned from 16, 17, 18. She would kick me out for one night at a time. Oh, Miles, you didn't do the dishes and I'm drunk. I'm going to kick you out. I would just wander the streets. If I had a little bit of money, I would sit at McDonald's and order some fries or something. Or I would just sit around or sleep on park benches. It got a little bit absurd. And I would approach some shelters, but there were no help. And it was all very confusing as a kid. 
And then when my exams draw uh, closer, she would go into drunken rages where I would have to either leave the house or she would actually forcefully kick me out for a few nights at a time. And it really did put me at a disadvantage when I came to my A-levels to with my studies. But um, I guess I, I did pretty well and uh, I got into Loughborough for physics. So that was okay. I mean, God. Um, okay. So so you do that, you go there, you finish there and off we go. So, there, okay, so you're in Afghanistan then. So, so tell me about, so you're in prison for a long time. So yes. tell me tell me about some of the interesting uh, incidents that occurred when you were in prison. I understand I understand Love that you were, you, 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 from um, our mutual friend, that you met an African-American ISIS fighter or something. Uh, yes. That... Of course, it happens to the best of us, yes. So <laughs> this jolly fellow, um, he was in Iraq as an American soldier in I believe 2011 or so. I can't reveal his name because it's not public at the moment. Uh, but the US are aware of the situation, I guess. So I meet him on my third or fourth day and he comes on in and he's this burly six foot four fellow, um, African-American. And he goes, yo, fuck white people. I'm American Mujahideen. I'm here to join the terrorists. I am the terrorists. I'm planning a terrorist attack and all you white people are gonna be killed. So the Taliban are like, uh, again, very confused. They don't know what to make of this guy. And he claims to be Muslim. And they're like, okay, okay, whatever. And then th they find out he tried to join ISIS. And of course, the Taliban aren't friends of ISIS. They actually were at a war with ISIS at the time. And ISIS had been decimated from Afghanistan with very small pockets coming up from here time to time. Mm. So they're saying, Goki, okay, you're joining our enemy. We don't appreciate this. You're also American, which is an arch enemy. We don't know if you're a spy or if you're crazy. He just sucker punches a member of the Taliban. Um, and of course, he gets put in isolation. So at one point when my friends leave, because they have EU citizenship, so they get sorted out pretty easily, I get put in this lovely guest house, which is a little bit more comfy. The head of foreign intelligence, he likes me as a person and goes, you know, we're going to give Miles some comforts. We think we're going to think he's innocent until proven guilty, whatever. So I'm in a nice place and this African-American is in the basement um, below me, chained up because he's literally crazy. And you go, Miles, if you want to talk to him because he seems like he's a bit lonely, give him some entertainment. And I go, yeah, sure. So I speak to him and he goes, oh, yeah, I'm American Mujahideen. and I'm here to join ISIS and I'm going to basically do a terrorist attack on the Burj Khalifa by uh, doing a 9-11 on it, basically, by hijacking a plane. And also, the Taliban's top guy, they respect me so much. I'm not really a prisoner. These chains is just uh, all fake. They're keeping me here as a performance to keep me safe from American Joe Biden, who's listening in on my brainwaves right now. You're actually the prisoner. I'm not. I have a chip in my brain and at the end of my penis that Joe Biden uses to talk to me. And Kim Kardashian also talks to me too. And they tell me, hey, I'm going to uh, kill you. I'm going to attack you. So each night I hear voices in my head and I have to do a ritual where I tell Joe Biden to fuck off through the power of Allah. <laughs> and, um, and of course, the reason I fled America is because I'm a famous rapper. I'm like Kanye's top guy. And I'm also Michael Jackson's long lost son. I'm worth a hundred million dollars. And if you knew my real name, you would know who I am. I'm so famous, everyone knows me. And he goes on like this for a good 20 minutes. And I'm just sitting there like, wow, so true. So true. Mm. He's, his brain's lost, so he's a very good actor. But this man is uh, unfortunately crazy. But I have no idea how he got the money to go to Afghanistan, figured out the bureaucratic process of getting a visa um, and all this other stuff. But the Taliban treat him as a spy. When I tell the Taliban, hey, uh, uh, this man says he's hearing voices in his heads and Joe Biden's talking to him, they go, oh, wow. They have the technology to put a chip or a breath or a phone inside his head and he's talking to the president himself. So we got a metal detector, like a little wand you see at the airport, and they're scanning it over his head. Like, where's the chip? Is it shielded from a metal detector? And I'm just watching this whole thing play out, just, just with popcorn in my hands, just going, oh, wow, this is, it, it's, at least it's not boring. <laughs> um, I come across one gentleman, too. Uh, well, how, I, I, our mutual friend told me that they turned to you and said, Miles are all, Amer are all African-Americans, are all black people like this. Yes, they asked me. They were like, what? it wasn't the higher-ups, but one of the lower guys who spoke English goes, are we, are we all like this, like black people? And I was like, 
to be honest, kind of. <laughs> I was like, there's a good chunk of them, um, from my experience at least. Um, yeah, I've been to South Sudan, South Africa, the whole of West and East Africa as well, and <laughs> they uh, there's certainly a good chunk of the population are like this. Um, we should import more in the West, by the way. That'll be good. Yes. Anyway, carry on. So what are you going to say? So another incident in in your long stay in prison. Yeah, so I meet another fellow. He he's a, apparently a midget, and he's got an inflated head. So, as in, f- literally inflated head. Uh, so he's got some birth defects. It seems to impact his cognitive function. And for what we gather, the other prisoners and I gather, he's from Turkmenistan, and he he went to Turkey illegally after his parents died. He worked in a farm or some informal sector, cash in hand, uh, overstayed his visa, whatever. And after a few years he got found out by immigration and he was deported. Now, the thing is, they didn't know what country he was from. No one spoke Turkmen in the actual uh, immigration services. So we just presumed he was from Afghanistan. And without any documents, they just deported him to Kabul. And he turned up on a flight to Kabul without any documents and any reason to be there. And the Taliban were like, what the fuck? Okay, we're going to imprison you now. We have no idea who you got here, and we have no one who speaks your language. We don't even know what language you're speaking. We're going to put you in prison until we can figure out how you got here. And then, of course, he was deported by the Taliban uh, after a few weeks of him being in a prison to tur- to uh, to Turkey. <laughs> That's where he came from. Yes. So I want. Isn't, I know there's an Uzbek minority in Afghanistan, isn't there? Yes, in the uh, northern provinces. But his, I wonder how similar Uzbek is to Turkmen. They're probably, probably related. They, quite honestly, they would probably find someone who could speak the language. But it's such an isolated country that the pockets of people um, that speak each language, they can't understand the next village over because they have evolved or at least existed so distant from each other. The accents and the slight dialects are just incomprehensible to each other. Uh, beyond just a few basic words. So there were some people who spoke Turkmen in the prison. They couldn't understand him and that he couldn't understand them. At one point, though, I actually did have my laptop with me. The Taliban gave me the most comfortable stay after a few weeks, I've got to admit. Uh, so he gave me my laptop. And then from there, uh, we were at a residential... There's a little fun on the... Okay. Uh, there was a little... So I was staying in a residential building. And right next to it, there was actually a Wi-Fi uh, hub, from what I understood. So I had my laptop, and there was no spyware on it or anything. And I could see next door had a Wi-Fi password. So I spent three months cracking, brute forcing this Wi-Fi password. And then one day, I guessed the correct password from uh, figuring out common passwords and also the username uh, of the actual Wi-Fi router. From there, I downloaded a, um, a Google Translate uh, application. Uh, using a virtual network or something like that. And we managed to talk to him finally. And it turns out he's like a chess champion in Turkmenistan. So he's he's mentally a child, but he's actually incredibly smart. So we, we end up um, doing some work with him. Turns out he knows all these um, university level physics concepts and maths concepts. Um, and it's, it's incredibly strange because we were with him for a few weeks. And we presume he's like he's got the mental capacity of a four year old and he acts like he does. Um, but then he just he's brilliant at some mathematics. And I just I have no idea how he got there. Autist, autistic savant, maybe. Perhaps so you, 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 you get this thing where, where you get people that well, normally they're blind and born very prematurely, which he isn't. But, mm. the, but the, the, the brain damage can happen in such a way that you can be absolutely brilliant on some very, very narrow kind of uh, intelligence ability but mm-hmm. otherwise fairly stupid and normally that so there's a guy called Derek Parvacini he was born I think 1979 about three and a half months early blind oh, yeah. mentally retarded but he's p- perfect pitch and you can give him any tune and he'll know it immediately and he'll play it in different styles or whatever mm-hmm. he's like a music, musical genius there's other ones where they're artistic geniuses um, and mm-hmm. Rain Man is an example of this of an autistic savant um, who's very good at mathematics so so there, there, there could be something, I don't know, something like that. Hydrocephalus, you see, it sounds like he has hydrocephalus, water on the brain. So um, you get this massive head and then like a balloon. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know, that's fascinating. Okay. 
God, all, all sorts. So you got schizophrenic American. Uh, what happened to him in the end? Did they did they kill him? Still what? He's still there. Okay. He's still there. So last time I went back to Afghanistan a few week a few weeks ago, I sat down with the head of foreign intelligence. We're having a picnic, and I go, you know, um, you know, the American guy still in prison. How's he doing? They're like, ah, oh, you know, ah, we don't like him. I go, you know, you know, how about if I go to the bazaar and I pick up a bunch of books and a bunch of multivitamins and a, a few snacks and we hand it over to him less complaining less trouble on your ends and you know why not do a nice thing and they go that's your money yeah why not so i um i give these people some nice stuff but uh he's still there i feel the u.s is trying to do a uh, diplomatic solution with the taliban there's a few u.s prisoners in in there and i believe there's some back-end deal going on and another one that our mutual friend told me about was that you met a guy and he said to you, no, no, Miles, he is, he is a very bad man. He is a very bad man. Don't, don't, is that the same guy? There was a pedophile or something? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the black uh, gentleman as well, there's infinite details about him because I spent eight months with him. But apparently he was trying to find a, a nine-year-old girl to marry so he can get Afghan citizenship. And he was in negotiations with this one village father to buy this daughter. And he was saying, but not to have sex with her, no. And he just started sweating frantically and looking very nervous, eyes darting around. I was like, I wouldn't have sex with a child, no. And I'll go, o okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's suspicious. And I go, have you been in prison before? He was like, yes, but not, but not for raping a child. And I go, okay, well, what were you in prison for? And he goes, well, I was in, I think it was Thailand. I was, oh, I was in Thailand and I came across this prostitute and the police said she was like a child, but no, she wasn't. But I was in prison. There was a TV there, and that was chill. And I was like, okay. And he's like, yeah, but um, all this other stuff. And he was just again, this these these truth nukes would come out of this weird, absurd life. And I I kind of debated if he was a spy or not because I thought okay he's clearly insane I went for Taliban said yeah he's crazy you know lay off him a little bit just let him do his thing maybe give him a book or two and he said well Miles we have a suspicions I go you know, express them to me and at this point they trusted me so he told me everything which is interesting too and he said well you know here's this man's phone have a look at this crypto account to tell us what you think and I open this cryptocurrency account and it's a hundred thousand dollars. I was being randomly deposited just before we came to Afghanistan. I think, oh golly, oh bother. This man has been paid by someone $100,000 just randomly the day before he came to Kabul um, for some reason. And of course, I know spies are paid in cryptocurrency a lot of the time. Like there was another prisoner, an Iranian man, and he was paid 12000 in cryptocurrency. He told us he was actually a nurse. Um, and nurses earn about $400 a month in Iran, roughly. So this is an absurd amount of money for him. And of course, it was just deposited in his account too, just before he jumped the border from Iran to Afghanistan. And like, I, I just think, you know, there's a pattern here forming here. Either there's some weird spy stuff going on, or it, it's someone just is really good at crypto trading and people just have huge portfolios that I just don't know about. So, okay, so you met you met a number of extraordinary people, and then what? Um, um, and you're in there for eight months, and so what? What? What eventually permits you to leave? Yes. So at one point, um, they figure out I'm not a spy. About halfway through, they were actually planning on releasing me. Uh, they were saying, okay, well, you know, there's two other British spies in Afghanistan. We've arrested them. Miles is maybe the third. Ah, we've done our investigation. He's fine. We we'll go release him. But then they received a phone call from, I believe, a, a troll or some someone. And I listened to the audio recording. It's some gentleman calling from, I believe it was Denmark or something, saying, Miles is a spy. Um, you need to look into him more. Uh, do not trust him, this type of thing. But they had no idea who he was. I listened to the audio recording. I was like, mm, ah, that's, that's embarrassing, but okay. So he kept me for a little bit longer. And eventually they said, okay, well, it's been eight months, Miles. Uh, we're terribly sorry about this, but uh, we hope we gave you a good time in contrast to, uh, you know, I did, actually did. Back to that country anytime you want. If you have a prisoner, aren't welcome back anytime, but you're welcome back. We actually could give you an apartment um, for free. I go, okay, thanks. 
And he said, also, um, we're going to give you this letter. The letter is saying, oh, you're an honorary member of Mujahideen. Um, you can go through military checkpoints without problems. And also, here's the contact of the head of foreign intelligence and a few ministers. You're welcome to come back and do business here and also do any YouTube videos. If you want to do anything that you normally can't do as a normal tourist, we'll organize it for you. And um, you're a funny guy as well. And now we're following you on Twitter. Enjoy. <laughs> lovely place. And I go, why not? It's an absurd story, but at least it's not boring. And I believe a good chunk uh, of the reason I was allowed back was because when I was in Taliban prison, I said, hey, I want my laptop. From there, I can read a million books and they'll keep me occupied and you know, it'll keep me busy. And they go, yeah, sure, why not? They give me my laptop. And I put together a pitch deck on PowerPoint, basically saying, hey, I want to, I want to, um, open a gold mine in Afghanistan. I want to do several other projects on an institutional level. I want to bring a lot of money to your country. And I want you to get, make a good chunk of change off it. We all make money. This is business. And now you're official government. I want to do business with you guys. So then I call all the Taliban into my, into my prison uh, cell, which is basically just a normal room with bars on it. And they go, come on in, come on in. I've been waiting for you. Please take a seat. And they're bewildered by all of this. I'm orchestrating it like some sort of business meeting. I tell them to sit down and I go for a pitch deck. And they're kind of like, Are you ready for the future of the West? 